Hi, I'm here with uh, Suzanne Davis, who is the author of a really, really interesting collection of short stories called The Appointed Hour. Uh, I just finished reading it a couple of weeks ago, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, welcome, Suzanne. How are you? Thank you. I'm well. Thanks for those kind words. It's nice to be here. That's great. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you for being here. Um, this is being uh, sponsored by Freshwater Literary Journal at Esnantuck Community College. And I, I got in touch with Suzanne because she submitted a short story to Freshwater. And we'll talk a little bit about that story later. But I want to focus for now on your book. And the first question I have for you, uh, so Esnantuck is in Connecticut, for those of you who don't know where is Nantuck Community College is. We're in the sort of north central part of the state, but you're uh, you're from rural eastern Connecticut, which is in many ways very similar to where is Nantuck is. And many of your stories in the appointed hour are set in uh, rural eastern Connecticut. Can you talk a little bit about how setting uh, is uh, an, an element of the fiction that you write? Yeah. Well, I have first of all that's such a great question and because for me, the land is a character. And I don't know as though I knew that when I was first getting started writing the stories, but it just became so clear that the setting, that these characters could not but arise from their setting and that the setting is sort of a balm to their soul. Um, and so the setting means a lot to me. I still feel very much sort of an advocate for the land, sort of a voice um, for those who live on it and for a way of life that we as a general culture may not see so much out in prominently in the literature of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when people think of Connecticut, I think sometimes they think of Hartford and the southern suburbs of New York, and they don't think of Connecticut being a rural state, but in many, many portions of Connecticut are uh, sort of, uh, in many ways, old New England. Um, in addition to the, the place uh, as, uh, as an element of your stories, time is an, uh, is an element as well. Uh, most of the stories seem to be set in sort of a generalized present but they also have a sense of timelessness where they're not pinned down by specific events on a calendar. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the sense of time, particularly with the stories that are, are present day stories? Well, it's interesting because I grew up on a farm in uh, Eastern Connecticut. My dad has a dairy farm. I come from six generations of farmers. My mm. dad and my brother still run that farm. But the sense of time there is different still. Uh, people, of course, you know, have cell phones and, and yet the, the way a day runs is sort of detached from many of the things that would seem to be important once you get a little closer to the cell towers and um, the more hectic city life, you know, there's a kind of rhythm that is about getting up and and seeing the sunrise or seeing geese uh, alighting on the field or from the field and so those sort of those elements of nature sort of give a sense of timelessness mm. that it, it, it seems in order to be true to the setting that's what the stories want to kind of illuminate from inside the experience. So, mm -hmm. um, and often I think that for me, my experience at least, and, and of the people who I love who are still on the land are in the stories of those generations. And so, so many times growing up, I was hearing stories and it was seemed so uh, powerful the way that the stories of the people from the past were still influencing the lives of people from the present, which I think is just true of our of us as human beings. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, w one really interesting element, while most of the stories are contemporary, there are two of the stories that are set hundreds of years ago. And you talk about those connections and links between generations, particularly in rural communities where they've been on the same land for hundreds of years. Um, that was a really interesting linkage. And also uh, another fun way that the stories link is that there are characters who might appear in one story as the protagonist and carry out most of the action of that story. And then they pop up again in other stories in, in different roles. And you can see the, the carryover in how they're the same character, but they're at a different stage in their development. They're at a different emphasis within the story. Can you talk a little bit about linking the stories with the characters in addition to the setting? So, well, the first story that um, sort of came in the collection was the one, The Ancestor's Voice, which is one of the stories you're referring to. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it was a chapter in an early novel. Mm -hmm. um, and the novel won the Hemingway First Novel Prize, but mm -hmm. I wasn't ready for it to be published because it was sort of close to the bone of the way I was sort of processing experience of my own life, which is mm. something I talk about with my students, how to be ready to say yes when things um, happen and come to you. So, but those characters wouldn't leave me. And it became clear to me that as I was writing individual stories and this area of Connecticut just kept being the place of the characters and, and the way they were working out um, things that were happening in their lives, that the story of the ancestor is sort of the heart of the collection, which is why it's in the middle. People oh. ask me sometimes when I've given readings, this is out of chronological order, why is that story in the middle? Um, so, so, the people who are in the rest of the stories are generally descendants from those first that first family in the ancestor's voice and how they work out the contract that the ancestors made um, with them each other in relationship and in relationship to the land what they might have sacrificed to it what sort of vitality and life they managed to find living with it living on it and then living with it um just seemed to keep popping up mm. and then as after i got a certain number of stories to put together um an agent suggested to me that you know that linking them with the, with the characters she, she asked me the question of oh is this person connected to this other person and it seemed that what i hadn't yet seen sort of came more to the surface uh -huh. yeah I, I i love how you talk about that and it's interesting that you mentioned that the the story that one of the two stories that's set hundreds of years ago is right in the middle of the book you do play around with that chronological order. Literally, the first story takes place after the second story with the, the same character. And I found that fascinating. And I confess, a little frustrating to read at first, but then very rewarding as you went along. So I admire that, that you're not afraid to sort of challenge readers a little bit, frustrate them a little bit, but then there's a payoff as you go along. And, and one thing that I really noticed about your stories is that pretty much every character suffers some kind of loss, some kind of tragedy. Uh, there may even be acts of violence at the centers of the stories. And yet all the characters seem to retain sort of a sense of hope and almost an optimism and, and their behavior carries them forward as if life is still worth living despite these horrible things that happen with the story at the center of the book way in the past and with many of the contemporary stories. Do you want to talk a little bit about that sense of characters remaining not like Pollyannius, however that word is pronounced, Pollyann-like, uh, uh, but still hopeful and optimistic? Yeah, well, I think that that was such, um, first of all, just I appreciate that you that up in the stories and that we get a chance to talk about it. I mean, 
I, I didn't do it consciously, but I, mm. it is something that is, I believe that myself, you know, that sort of having hope in, um, in humanity and what uh, James Agee, who's one of my favorite authors, um, called a divine humanism, sort of the, mm. you know, that aspect of goodness that is in us uh, innately. And that that is something that gives us hope to carry forward into the future. One of my first influences, maybe for, as was true for many young writers, was Flannery O'Connor. Uh, and, you know, she sort of has <laughs> a very wicked sense of humor, which I could not really pull off on the page. I, I wish I was that funny. Um, but, but she also isn't afraid to look at some really hard things about humanity and and yet you feel by going through the journeys with the characters how one can strengthen a sense of resilience or understanding to kind of navigate um, life which is a gift always yeah that's great that's it. flannery o'connor that's a wonderful connection to your writing in many ways i can see that inspiration um and another thing that, that connects with uh, her writing and a lot of really good short story writing is that the characters in The Appointed Hour, uh, well, there's the, the sense that uh, a, a lot of people look for really sympathetic characters in writing, in, in what they read. And I found some of the characters very sympathetic. You really connected with them, but some of them, I was pretty angry with, <laughs> and uh, you know, in particular, uh, Ricky in the story, uh, the laws, the law of gravity. I was very angry with him, and it made the story much stronger. So, uh, can you write about, or excuse me, can you talk about writing stories with characters who who do seem to know what's right, do seem to have a good moral sense, but don't always do the right thing? Yeah. Well, I think again, it's just this is true of humanity. Right? So if we're mm. going to write from a place of trying to understand the truth of humanity, it means being not afraid to reveal that truth on the page with the hope that we as readers sort of can set it in a context of seeing the full spectrum of our humanity. And then from that, sort of having insights that come to us, you know, because even in the sense of having a strong reaction and saying, why would the character do something like this? Why? Mm. Which is, you know, and it is, it's a disturbing thing. Um, so I, I hope that, I guess that sometimes those stories sort of hook me or capture me as a writer because I myself am trying to understand how can there be aspects of our humanity that um, where people would make these choices and yet it seems that if we don't at least in some way reflect on them on the page and in our lives we we they have they have power over us instead of us having power over them that's a really good way to put it that's uh, the connections with life that not all of the people we know in real life are sympathetic. Uh, many people do things we don't understand and we uh, that anger us. And reflecting that in fiction works really well. And I think it, it, it's uh, one of the greatest strengths of, of your book is how the characters are, are portrayed realistically, sympathetically, but realistically at the same time. And it works really well. One of my favorite stories in the book is the one called Choices. And uh, there's a really interesting structure there. Uh, and it's in many ways, it's a really simple structure because you frame it with it beginning in the present and then flashing back to a really important event that helped shape what happens in the present and then coming back to the present at the end uh, to sort of have a resolution, um, but still be a little bit open-ended and um, can you talk a little bit about, about that structure? Uh, I guess the big thing for me is that they almost seem like different characters in the flashback, and yet you can see how they are the same. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Well, I think um, that the structure in that story 
in the end, sort of it is a microcosm of the structure of the whole collection. Mm. The idea that we find ourselves in a moment of time in our present day, whatever our lives may be, and that there is something from the past that might still be uh, just a thread of, of an opportunity, an invitation to, to understand ourselves better, to forgive, you know, so that the way that we love in relationship and in, in our world might be a more, um, I don't want to say, I don't know the best way to put it, that we would, that we would be free you know, mm. in, in an essential way, free of the past and, and the way to perhaps in this story that the characters, um, the story sort of shows the something that one event that happened and then, um, and then their ability to, to have lived another big chunk of their lives um, and sort of come to some sense of peace mm. with the way that particular event from the past unfolded and where they are now as a result of how that unfolded. That's, I think peace is a great word there because it's not really a sense of closure. Yeah. Everyone talks about how uh, psychologically closure is important, but you can achieve peace without closure. And I think that comes through really well in the story by using that structure. And, and speaking of, of nerdy things like structure uh, in writing fiction, here's a couple of nerdy questions. So some of your stories are first person, some are third person, uh, some are present tense, some are past tense. Could you talk a little bit about some of those technical things and, and the choices you make in writing a story? Well, it, it, sometimes it just comes down to how do I first hear the story? Um, if I can hear the character's voice and sort of and the story feels, because st point of view, which I think sometimes we don't talk enough about when we talk about uh, craft with you know students or young writers, because to me, point of view ends up making the story. Um, as we know, we can look at some event that happens and how people see it says everything about what the story then is. So I was always trying to get to the place of the most immediate heartbeat of what was on the, you know, what seemed like it wanted to be on the page. And sometimes the way to get to that was through one character's first person voice. It was a third person voice. And sometimes it, it seemed that whatever then that character was experiencing that the reader could experience as well needed to be in present tense, mm -hmm. but sometimes it needed to be in past tense so that the vantage point from which the character was looking at it could layer in some of that um, perspective. And yeah. So in that yeah. way, I, it was what each story needed, not so much what the collection needed. The only mm. story that I can say that I took that into consideration for the whole collection was the story at the end. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of those nerdy things and speaking of students, uh, you're also a writing teacher. Can you talk a little, a little bit about your philosophy of teaching writing and, and how... Uh, the whole the careers as a teacher and as a writer, how they mesh for you? Well, I will say that I love teaching and that for me, it's been a really kind of exhilarating thing to both be able to write and which is such a solitary endeavor, as you know, and then to have, be able to talk about stories with other writers, you know, young writers who really they've given me such a tremendous sense of hope my students I, I love them and you know when they come into the room and they've put everything on the page and they're so willing to be vulnerable and mm. i just find that to be so absolutely refreshing you know that they want to 
use their words and their stories to um, to make meaning and whatever you know and they want to believe that they can take that and make a career from it so mm -hmm. they're not jaded <laughs> you know by um and they and so that's been a great thing sometimes i will say it's a bit of a challenge trying to navigate both things and mm -hmm. um you know i often find that uh, if i a chunk of writing like a novel will have to wait until a break like the summer or between the semesters um but sometimes i just you know i'll tell myself and i say this to the students like 300 words a day mm. and so no matter if it's a busy semester or not it may not be early morning maybe it's late at night it might be three o'clock in the morning you know i can just open my computer and and get 300 words a day and keep my head inside of the writing yeah that's that's so important i know anne lamott talks about writing like the small window pick out a small piece of whatever it is you're writing uh focus on that get that down and then expand it look farther into that window she also talks about you know writing bird word by word bird by bird uh where you take a what you can do at that moment you get it done and then come back and do more and it eventually accumulates and i think balancing the writing and teaching careers that's so important um and i find the students pretty inspiring as well it is really you know it's it, when teaching creative writing sometimes you get some students who are clearly there just to check off a box on a required uh set of courses and they're just recycling something they wrote in high school and they they think it's creative writing it must be wonderful and easy but it really is inspiring when those students the ones who don't think they're going to grow as writers you give them a little bit of feedback you give them a little bit of advice and really read what they've written and see where you can find ways for them to make it even better uh, and they they take off and they really get something from that that can be really inspiring um so uh the story that you sent to Freshwater, uh, the story called uh, Why Mrs. Morrison Was Too Busy to Die. So very intriguing title. Uh, when I first read it, I thought we were going to have some kind of a ghost story. Uh, and this story also was like some of the ones in your collection where when I first started reading it, I was thinking, there's something going on here, but I'm not quite sure what. And then the story has an, a, I guess you could call it sort of a subtle epiphany where you realize something and you think, wait, do I have that right? And then it goes off in a direction that's both surprising and really well motivated. Um, can you talk a little bit about that story? Yeah, that story has a really sort of personal, <laughs> um, uh, it's personal for me uh, just to be, my, my brother struggled with addiction and ah. um, he died as a result of um, you know his body and, and the addiction mm. and so i will just say that the opioid crisis in america is uh to me just a a, a source of great it makes me angry mm. at the way um the so many aspects of it you know it is to me a um, addiction of despair in rural America. Mm. And, um, and so this character and the way she, I don't want to give too much of the story away, but yeah. anyway, so, you know, what's going on in that story is something that I see going on today all across mostly rural america but it isn't only rural america yeah it's overshadowed right now because of the pandemic but interestingly it seems to me that there you know that if i that mrs morrison could easily be like a frontline worker in the pandemic as mm. much as she is you know is trying to provide um comfort for those families who have lost a loved one to addiction and so where we are culturally at this moment with 
you know, um, with how to help people um, sort of in the midst of their loss and mm. what to do to remedy those situations um, is, uh, is a question for all of us. Absolutely. And it's, it, it's really universal too, because even though it is set in a small town, rural type setting, uh, there were elements to it that could very easily be related, uh, related to by people who live in urban areas. Uh, and particularly near the end of the story, uh, where it goes in a direction that, that I as a reader was not expecting but could understand. Um, it, it's, it's really universal. It's, it's more than uh, like other people's problems. It's something that we can all connect with and all relate to. And I think uh, most of your fiction works that way in the book as well. So that story will be in Freshwater Literary Journal uh, this spring, usually around May we publish. So that's something for folks to look forward to. Uh, what else can we look forward to? What's next for you as a writer? Uh, well, I the next thing I'm working on, I just finished a draft of a novel. Ah. So I'm now trying to get that to find its home. Um, and that is a book called Stray Dog Watch Over. And Ooh. it comes back to this section of Connecticut um, and sort of braids together the stories of two of two siblings living very different lives uh -huh. and so hopefully you know we'll we'll get that a home and um, the next thing that I'm writing is a book called uh, as long as the sweet grass grows mm. and so it it's set in uh, sort of the fictional New London area Norwich in the in the short story collection, the ancestor's voice in the fictional town of Bellaport mm -hmm. is sort of that Norwich, New London area, of Connecticut, and um, so it will go. It will braid together a story of back from the late 1500s and the story of two. Oh characters one a journalist sort of fallen from grace from the new york times back in the area and oh. a local journalist and an incident that has happened and so and how that ties back to the history uh, of the area from the 1500s oh that sounds fascinating i love those connections between the past and the present yeah. um that's definitely something that we'll be looking forward to yeah. Thank you very much for speaking with me today. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell us before we sign off? Well, I would just say thank you so much, John. And I really appreciate this. Um, you're giving the stories uh, a life, I know, uh, through the interview. And for all, everyone out there, both reading and just living, um, you know, to stay stay strong <laughs> stay strong stay safe uh I, I like that we're saying those words right now um the book is the appointed hour a fantastic collection of linked short stories by suzanne davis thank you again for being with us thank you john bye bye bye